Okay, so Leon are up next. This is part four of the Athletics Crisis Club series, examining the financial state of five European football clubs all week. So today I'm joined one last time by the Athletics senior football news reporter, Matt Slater, and Adam Crafton is in the studio as well. Right, let's start with Leon. Adam, in short, if you can, why are Leon on our list? Um, a difficult one to do in short, um, but that's why we have the podcast to try and exp- to hopefully explain <laughs> it. Um, the headline is that they are, you know, one of the most famous clubs in France and they are bottom of the league after 12 games, which is a pretty, a pretty difficult thing to, to achieve, really, for a club of the size of Lyon. You know, you're, we, you may be used to a team starting four or five games slowly, seven or eight, but to be 12 games in, only have one win on the books so far, it is a massive problem. Um, a club that size, you know, if you think of the best of Lyon, then you think of a side that won the league seven times in a row at the turn of the century, a club that has recruited really well, a club that has sold really well traditionally, a club that built a new stadium that opened in 2015-16, 59,000 seater stadium. Next year at that stadium, they'll be hosting Taylor Swift and they'll have Coldplay and they've just had a few games at the Rugby World Cup and they'll have the Six Nations and uh, they'll be doing some football in the Paris Olympics uh, in Lyon. Um, So you've got all the ingredients there in theory for Lyon actually to be a really successful club, but they're not there at the moment. And there's a big background to all of this, which is, which kind of merges probably so much of what you've spoken about this week already, which is the challenges of being a club that builds a new stadium and how paying for that has an influence down the line in terms of your ability to compete, particularly when you're competing with clubs that have been backed like Paris Saint-Germain or clubs that have been backed like Monaco with uh, Russian investment over the past decade or so as well. Um, You then bring into it um, a change of ownership or a change of control between what you would kind of consider the real old school of ownership, which is one guy, Mr. President, Jean-Michel Aulas, who was so... If you think of the most famous European football executives of the early part of the 21st century, this guy was amongst the main men. You had the G14, (laughs) which was like one of the original exclusive groups of football executives, which he was at the top of. That was before you had like the European Club Association and things like that. Um, Lyon were a club you'd always see in the Champions League. But the idea was you had this guy who'd taken over in 1986, 87, and he'd been there 30, over 35 years and he was Mr. Leon and they were going to be able to compete and he was, for better and worse, he was the owner. You knew what the focus was. You then have a takeover and that takeover, in theory, was actually quite a good idea. You had a US investor, uh, John Texter, which was what what we refer to as these multi-club models. So you had Leon coming in under a group called Eagle Eagle Football Holdings and there's other teams in that group you have um, he's got a stake in Crystal Palace but it's not a majority Mm. stake he's got majority control of Botafogo in Brazil you've got Molenbeek in Belgium who since he's taken over there they've been promoted Botafogo have been in a title race in Brazil and if you've not paid attention to that race it's worth actually tuning in because it's one of the most amazing title races you'll see Um, and he, he went into Leon, and the idea was that it builds out that portfolio. So you would have, I, sp- I suppose in his ideal, you'd have at the top of this tree, Crystal Palace and Leon potentially as an English club and a French club that can trade players of real high value, players that you know you can move around for big money. And then you can develop talent in Brazil and move them into the European market. They can get those difficult work permits in Belgium, perhaps, if you're bringing them from Brazil that are, that are far more difficult post-Brexit. I'm aware this is a really long answer, so cut in at any <laughs> I'm point. I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting. At, 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 any, at any point you <laughs> want. Map to cut in and go, do you know what? Can we sub this down? Yeah. So <laughs> the idea is all of those different clubs could dovetail nicely. It could help Molenbeek because they could get a player before they when they're still attainable and then they could sell them on for big value. You could move them from Belgium to Lyon to help grow that value before they then get a move to the Premier League. Um, so, so those were some of the synergies that we were aimed at. And actually the initial idea was 
Jean-Michel Ouellet, as this guy who has been there for a very, very long time, would actually stay. He would basically on a management contract for a few years and effectively carry on running the club. The problem's been the new guy and the old guy have fallen out pretty spectacularly. Um, so that's probably a good point for you to jump in with any questions we've got so far. <laughs> but you asked how we've I mean, got that, there, well, and, that's, it, and that's before we even get into COVID and French media it, rights. It, well, that, 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 that's where I usually bring Matt in. Um, yeah. The COVID question, you know, yeah. broadcast rights, all that kind oh, of yeah. stuff. I mean, how, how, how does, has COVID affected Lyon in particular? And I guess let, let's have a little roundup of how it affected the French League in general. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you go back to your sort of original question, I suppose, about, you know, how did Leon get here and why are Leon in this list? I think it is quite interesting to compare them to the clubs that have come before. And, and as Adam has explained, they tick a lot of the right boxes. They, they shouldn't be here. So if you compare them, let's say, to, to Everton, Barca and Inter, all those clubs have stadium projects ongoing and they're not doing that well. OK, maybe Barca, as we explained, will get there. And Everton have got a lovely stadium that's, you know, Two thirds built. We've got to finish paying for it. But anyway, Leon, Leon did it. Um, they've had success. Okay, look, sport is cyclical, as we've already discussed on the mm. on the series in the series, and they're in a you know they're in a down moment. Um, they get a lot right in terms of player development. They got a fantastic women's team. They even did the things that we've all talked about again on this podcast thinking about footfall and sweating your asset and getting people through the door and mm. you know so you don't just use your stadium 25 times a year you use it every day so they built an arena mm. right to bring more events more sport so they've done loads right so why are they on the list hmm well because for some of the reasons that Adam has gone through you know mm. there was a messy takeover they were stretched the stadium stretched them they probably were stretched on the playing budget as well. And then these two big external shocks happen. It's always it's always the external shock and it's all it's always what sort of state were you in as you went into this shock? You know, what was your plan B? What was your plan C? And for Leon they were stretched. And this is really something that we can say about all French football. Mm -hmm. COVID was bad. You know, it, it they 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 were the, they shut down. They didn't restart. They paid a big, broad, you know, relatively speaking, they paid a big broadcaster rebate, and then they were in a hurry to start a new broadcast contract. And I think this is something that really hurt Leon. So this is where we get into this whole again. This is something we've we've briefly touched upon. You know, the value of rights, and you know, everyone's trying to compete with the Premier League. The French TV mm -hmm. deal did this massive blockbuster deal with a company called Media Pro, a completely untried and tested company outside of Spain, where they have a track record and they have customers and people knew who they were and they knew what they were doing. Media Pro stuff full of Chinese money, which reminds everybody of the inter conversation we were yeah. having, the Chinese football mm -hmm. boom. Yes, so it all ties together. Media Pro were going to try and expand into other markets and France was the one they really went for. And I remember they had this big push to get to a billion euros per season. This is the French League. And that was going to be their domestic and international rights. And they went with Media Pro, which meant turning their backs on their long-term partner, the Sky Sports, if you like, of French mm -hmm. media landscape, Canal Plus. And long story short, it was a disaster. The whole thing unraveled in the most ludicrous fashion within months. And it meant that French TV, all these French clubs, and Lyon had pushed the deal, by the way, were left with half the money they thought they were getting through the door during COVID. So you have the COVID shock and how French footballers in general dealt with COVID, didn't resume, paid a big rebate. And then you had this TV deal that was way less than they were expecting. And then you have some decisions made and you know they didn't make Europe and you know that whole cyclical thing. So that's why Leon are here. I, I think as, as well, Matt, th there was a particular impact for Leon in, so whereas the English league um, mm. paused and then restarted and finished the season, what happened in France was the, I think basically the government said, you're not coming back. And Lyon were very unhappy about this. And why were they unhappy about this? Well, mostly because they were seventh in the table at the time it stopped. And they probably thought, you know, maybe seven or eight to 10 games left. We, we haven't not been in Europe since 1997 at that point. 
will find a way to get it because that's you know that's how it tends to work the big clubs tend to get there in the end by hook or by crook so it stopped and the points per game formula had them finishing seventh so it meant they were outside Europe for the first time in well t- over 20 years and since then actually in the three full seasons I think since they've, fought, they've been out of Europe for two of those three years mm-hmm. now you can get away with it once maybe twice once it becomes three years when you don't have that brilliant broadcast deal domestically or internationally anymore, you're you're in, you're in trouble because then you're really just left with match day revenue. Yeah. So that's it. That's it. That's your third. Sponsorship. It's your third budgetary shock, yeah. then, isn't it? It's it's COVID. It was the TV deal being not as good as we thought it was going to be, and we've missed Europe. Something that and, we have always budgeted for. Yeah, and and the fourth one is the only other way you can kind of smart your way out of that is by being amazing on player trading. And that's yeah. something Leon had been really good at, right? If Even if you look at, I think, between 2015 and 22, only four clubs in Europe made more money from players they had trained through their academy than Leon. You can go through a list of, of famous names that have come through Leon. Players like uh, Lacazette, Umtiti, uh, who else? I say you can go through. But th- there's a long, long list of Hatem Ben Arfa, Anthony Martial, a lot of players. Benzema. Are, Benzema, right? And as a result of that, they'd been able to not only succeed for quite a long time, but quite often by making money as well. I mean, even in the past three years, I think they've brought in 200 million more or so than they've actually spent in the transfer market. Now, that's that's not a problem as long as you're doing well. I think now fans are looking at that and thinking, should we be spending a bit more of mm-hmm. what we're bringing in? Uh, they're going to have to. Yeah. yeah. And also, there's a couple more factors within that that we'll get to around mm-hmm. limitations that have been put on Leon in the transfer market but what they did start to let slip on was they'd always been a club that had, a bit like Daniel Levy had always been t- been described as this tough negotiator mm-hmm. this guy that always gets a good deal when he's selling I think that was the perception in France of Jean-Michel Aura. and what you had start to happen were a few misjudgments so a player like do you remember Hussein Maor I think I pronounced mm-hmm. that right. Yeah. Midfielder. I think it's supposed to be going to Arsenal or there were Midfielder, links anyway to yeah, various Premier League links clubs. Links to Arsenal, Spurs. I remember mm-hmm. writing transfer stories about interest in him. You were talking mm-hmm. 50 million or so at the time. He ended up leaving on a free because Leon really dug in. They thought that he would continue to progress at Leon, And actually what happened was changes of managers. He went out of favour. All of a sudden he didn't want to extend a contract. He ends up leaving for free. It can happen. But when your margins are so mm-hmm. tight and relying on that revenue, it becomes a problem. And it wasn't only him. You had Memphis Depay, yeah, yeah. a little bit similar situation. You had Moussa Dembele, who's now a Aletifak, who could have gone for decent money at that time. So even though in that period they still did some really good deals, Bruno Guimaraes, who ended up at Newcastle, 40-odd million. Lucas Paquetar signed for about 5 million from Milan and ends up going to West Ham for 40-odd million even more, I think, 50 million. Mm. And I think there probably would have been a sell-on if he'd gone to City in the summer, which would have helped. So it's not as simple as like, you know, they've messed up everything because they've not. They've been unlucky in some senses. There's been different circumstances. And then the other problem they had last summer, which maybe explains how they've started this season, and that this isn't only the fact that you still had pretty outdated coach in Laurent Blanc mm-hmm. starting the season, Um they were also restricted in what they were able to do in the transfer market by the, essentially it's the French DNCG, which is like the financial watchdog, um, mm. which you have to submit to, I think, every kind of Christmas and before the summer ahead of the January uh, summer transfer windows so that you have an idea of what you're going to be allowed to spend. And the idea of it is really good. The idea is it protects clubs from doing a Portsmouth, from overspending, from going beyond their means. It's probably edging towards over-regulation relative to what we see in the English game, I would say. But it's there to protect clubs. And they took issue with the financial plans that were being presented by Lyon last year, which meant that last summer, Lyon weren't able to spend very much. So they ended up doing three transfers, loans, and some pretty weak deals. Yeah, and this this DNCG, this, it's a nice little um, halfway house, really, between what we were talking about with uh, Barcelona on Tuesday uh, in terms of their long-running battle with La Liga's very um, tough and um, bespoke budget system where each club is basically handed 
a budget based on, you know, you've got too much debt, what, what are you bringing through the door? I think the French system is, is, isn't as strict as that, it's certainly, but it's equally more strict than the very laissez-faire approach that um, we were talking about on Monday with Everton, where it's always retrospective. And, you know, OK, let's have a little, you know, how did you account for that? So it sort of sits somewhere in the middle. And I think, uh, well, um, you know, Adam gets into it really nicely in his piece is, again, with this change of control from, you know, Monsieur President, someone who sat on French committees for ages and ages, everybody knew him, to this, you know, slightly upstart American fella walking through the door. The previous set of American owners in the French League hadn't gone particularly well. And Texter, rightly or wrongly, feels that he's being held to a higher standard than most. There's a little bit of anti-Americanism there. I'm not sure. There certainly probably is a little bit of anti-John Texter going, mm. <laughs> going on here mm. because he can be a tiny bit brash. And has he managed that relationship with Olas very well? No, he hasn't. Is it all his fault? No. Mm. Is there a case here of seller's remorse? 100%. Did Texter pay maybe a little bit too much? Yeah, probably. So... You know, there is there's a sort of personal element to this story, and then there is this sort of institutional angle as well with you know how how French clubs have to interact with their French with their sorry with their financial fair play regulators. The text or all else thing is is fascinating mm. because it is old meets new, and mm. it was a good it was a good idea, right? Like you get a new guy in, but you let the old guy kind of can, carry on taking care of things. Like I think they both meant well mm. to a certain extent, but it's a bit like someone buying a house but letting you carry on living in the spare room and then getting really offended when you start changing the furniture around. And, and that's, that's where I don't have that much sympathy, to be honest, um, with our last in the middle of all of that. It got pretty nasty in the summer. Um, mm. Not yeah, nasty, just a bit, far, a bit shambolic, really, I think. He's, he's to, done personally well out of this, let's not forget. Yeah, right? And I think supporters in the summer, so there was a press conference, I think a texter kind of suggested that um, there'd been a previous warning from the DNCG to to Leon, and that he didn't know about this when he acquired the club. You then had Texter through his group coming mm-hmm. out and saying, you know, if he's saying that, it's not true. And then there's a defamation case, and that's messy. I mean, this like this guy Alas, he's not disappeared. He's still got a president's box. Mm-hmm. He's still going going to games, and it's a bit like when Wenger left Arsenal, right? As soon as a legend like this leaves. The memory of them becomes pretty good, right? Because you start thinking of, oh, look at everything they did for mm-hmm. Leon. Took over when they were second division, indebted. We were winning leagues with mm-hmm. him. Now we're bottom of the league. And actually, the reality is a bit like late Wenger, late Olas wasn't very good, right? Leon had fallen had fallen off before Texter came in. But I think there is that bit of frustration right now with both both. Both of that ownership, both of the size of that ownership, which probably helps the new head coach, uh, Fabio Grosso, who's come in, because I think the fans now are almost thinking he's got it tough. You know, dealing with these two people going at each other all the time in public, he needs to keep us up. So we, as a fan base, are going to get behind him. And just one point on the fan base: I mean, you don't mess around with the ultras in Leon lightly. They. I think they lost against PSG 4-1 early in the season, uh, after which Laurent Blanc was sacked. And they basically, one of the fans got a megaphone, and you have this extraordinary video, go and find it online, where one of the ultras is basically just telling the players to pull their socks up mm-hmm. and saying they're not putting a shift in. So, you know, other players have glorified this shirt. You're going to be uh, smearing it or tarnishing it. I mean, it's amazing theatre to watch, but it's also... I can't imagine going out at Leon as a player right now for a home game and feeling particularly comfortable around it. The question is, how do they get out out of this mess? They're sitting bottom of, you know, League R, um, no European football. And also, I, I, you mentioned it earlier, the academy. I mean, is there a way out? I know they, sell, they, they sold Buckler to um, PSG very recently and the president naturally was not happy. That was key Leon talent. But is there any, is there any pickings from the talent? Um, the youngsters at, at the Leon talent that I, I they think, can think, rely on or maybe build on for the future? Yeah, I, th- I think one of the problems they've got is they are, you know, they're running out of players to sell. Um, I think what will help is because they sold a couple of players in the summer and you also got Malo Gusto went to Chelsea for 30 odd million. 
I think the feeling is they're selling players quicker than they would have done previously. I think that's one of the concerns because they've kind of had to, to balance the books being out of European competition. Mm-hmm. Um, because of who they sold in the summer, they should be able to have a better deal with the DNCG for January. And I think Texter's intention is to invest. I think he recognises that he probably got it wrong in terms of the timing around keeping Laurent Blanc as long as he did, in terms of overestimating perhaps how good this squad is to a certain extent. It needs investment. He knows that. Um, more broadly, you know, one of the thing one of the things Matt mentioned, which I should have mentioned at the top as well, is I mean, Leon's women's team has been a jewel in the crown in many sense. When mm. Leon's men's team stopped winning, you had this women's team that was again another example of Leon doing things right. Yeah, being right? forward thinking. Being forward thinking, yeah. getting on that curve, winning a load of Champions Leagues. And even in the, you know, that's not gone away. I think they won two thousand twenty two mm-hmm. as well, right? So but what is happening now, because there is a there is, I think, around four hundred and fifty million or so worth of debt. Mm-hmm. And the way around that appears to be selling the arena that Matt mentioned. So you've got this arena that they built, a multi purpose sports and entertainment by the stadium. So they're going to sell that, which will help. Um they're selling well, selling, doing a joint venture with the women's team with a US investor called Michelle Kang. Um that's a great name, isn't it? Yes, yeah, yep. Michelle Kang. Michelle yeah. Kang, who is also uh, involved with the Washington Spirit in the NWSL in the States. So as a result of that, Leon are also going to have to sell OL Reign, which they acquired a few years ago because you can't have two teams in the same league in the States. So they're going to yeah. raise a bit of money that way. And then there's also a bond issue, if mm-hmm. you want to explain that. Yeah, well, look, so as... Uh, they're selling assets, right? Yeah. So again, this mm. we're going back to the Barcelona conversation, aren't we? How do you get out of it? We have to sell stuff. So they're selling stuff, but and and I think some of the criticism of Texter is that it looks like a fire sale. What what he will say is that no, this is all planned and strategic, and and there is some truth in that, in that he was talking about this stuff right from the outset. So the the Leon women's team story is interesting. He genuinely sees this as a as a good, clever, positive thing to do. It's going to be a joint venture with this business partner called Michelle Kang, who is a real champion of women's soccer in the States. So that was planned. Now, the timing and the perception, though, is the problem. It does look like he is flogging something that used to be good at Leon. The OL Reign team, they're based in Seattle. Look, you know, that that's, that's you could argue, is a sort of sensible move. It, it was a non-core probably a bit of a distraction if they can get a good price for it because now's a good time to sell you know women's soccer franchises in the states great uh, they're actually using the same the same bank rain that sold the sold chelsea and um you know, trying to sell manchester united so you know again there are parallels with other things we've talked about i think the arena is probably a slightly more interesting one and probably is a bit more of a, ah, right, we've got a bigger hole to fill here than I thought. In that that arena, I do remember when it was built and I remember you know, a couple of consultants telling me that I think they'd actually worked on the project. That's exactly the type of thing that all forward thinking uh, football clubs should be doing, um, you know, really kind of like trying to trying to sort of create a kind of walled garden around your club, trying to get people involved, trying to keep them there longer. That, well, they're selling it. And I think what Texter would say is, look, we're having a look at the forward projections. We think it will bring this much in over the next 25 years. I think we can sell it now for pretty much the same amount and hand it over to someone else. It's all good. Who knows, right? We, 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 we haven't got, we're not looking at the books. He tells me, he tells people it's a good deal. We, we shall see. I, th- I think the controversy with that is, where does that money from the arena yeah. go? Um, I know mm. there's been some reporting, I think, on Bloomberg Financial Times saying some of it may go into the Eagle Football Group, this multi-club yeah. funding sort of academies around. I think there's one in Africa, one I think in the it States. Will. I think it will. He wants. So again, this this is that kind of clash of um, personality, but also clash of strategy. You know, Leon have gone from being the apple of someone's eye, mm. the most important thing in a man's world, and um, they are now an important thing in a group's world. But where they sit in that group's pecking order isn't clear. And this is where I, I, I often come back to any conversation about a multi-club is you have to be totally clear about what you're trying to do. So 
the ones that appear to work quite well are ones that have clearly defined strategies and clearly defined pecking orders. So if you think about Red Bull, mm. right? So Red Bull, you've got these two teams, Leipzig and Salzburg. They, you know, Leipzig's probably the more important one because they're in the bigger league, but Salzburg is the sort of one that's probably closest to Red Bull's heart. But let's be honest, the most important thing in that group is Red Bull, the energy drink. It is all about selling energy drinks, the way they play football, their whole messaging, you know, and everyone is working to that, to that end. The football kind of work, works quite nicely. City Football Group, totally obvious and clear who's in charge. It works. But you look at Eagle Football Group, and there's a couple others, you know, 777, of course, where I'm not sure what the plan is. You know, they, they talk a really good game about synergies and cutting costs and sharing best practice and creating a kind of player trading model. Yeah, it's great. It's like a sort of, you know, a PhD thesis. It's brilliant. Go on, then prove it. Because otherwise it looks like you've just running, instead of running one club, which is really, really hard and not maybe doing very well at it, you're running five, six, seven, eight clubs and not doing very well at it. And you are just compounding problems. So that's, you know, the theory that, you know, the jury's very much out on, on Eagle football and Leon is sort of sitting in the middle of this experiment in the same way that Everton may well sit in the middle of an experiment. And that's, again, an uneasiness about Leon's situation. But also, dare I say, you have to be honest, a possible way out. So to, you know, to turn it around, these sales, these asset sales could get them out. They're going to refinance debt. That's great. That's sensible. And you know, this multi-club model might just work. We shall see. It did help them in the summer. I mean, the one thing Leon fans may have seen as a positive in the summer when you had these limits on the transfer market something they were able to do which some people will look at and think it's pretty controversial other people will say it was pretty clever in the circumstances Molenbeek Belgian team just being promoted from the second Belgian division by a player for 25 million euros from uh, FC Norgeland Ernest Neumar sort of 20 year old uh, wide player he goes to Molenbeek and immediately goes on loan to Lyon Right, So it was a player that Leon wanted, but they couldn't afford to buy him because of the restrictions. So you get him into a different club within Eagle and then immediately get him on loan. A lot of clubs looked at that and were like, shit, we need to change the rules. right? Because yeah. this, is an, this is a way, they would say, of getting around financial restrictions and having an advantage that we don't have unless we're in a multi-club model. The flip side of that is, we are getting towards a stage where pretty much every club in France or Belgium is part of a multi-club model. So maybe it kind of just works. Yeah, I was just thinking, I mean, bring me on quite nicely onto this really is, is this multi-club ownership. And, you know, we've just seen on Tuesday news that Premier League clubs have voted to block a, a temporary ban on, on loaning players. Is this the future? Is there any regulation that can take place or have you wait for Mr. Boat on this? Um, Matt, we'll start with you on this. Well, it's, it's the present um mm. you know it's it's just exploded as a as a concept um have uefa missed the boat possibly you know they are, they are trying hard i think they're scrambling really to sort of kind of fix problems as they pop up when they possibly you know it's all it's all we can all be really hind uh, wise in hindsight can't we but if you go back to that kind of original red bull case or even before that when the first rules on multi club if you like though people weren't referring to it in those terms back then was enic um, yeah. When that was, um, you know, the people that ended up at Tottenham, you know, they had a they had stakes in in various clubs across across Europe, and they were the, that was the first time UEFA started to think about it in terms of competitive integrity. So, mm. you know, what happens if the same owner has various clubs in the same competition? You know, I think we can all get our heads around that 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 is a potential integrity issue. So that's where we had this idea of control. You know, you can't have control over more than one club in the same competition and you know the next big case was Red Bull where both Leipzig and, and Salzburg were eventually allowed to play in Europe and it, it required this most ludicrous piece of accountancy and governance footwork to um, to sort of distance the two clubs you know RB Leipzig Red Bull Salzburg and separation and making sure that there weren't people that had worked for each other honestly it was all a bit of a fudge and that's where we're at you know, and now, as more multi-club groups have popped up with, let's say, a clearer idea around player trading, we're now seeing the leagues, but also UEFA going, well, 
this is really tricky now. You're posing me problems that I hadn't thought of. I just thought about the integrity of my competitions. I'm now trying to think how on earth I apply financial fair play rules mm. when you could be sharing sponsors, you can be sharing players, you can be you know, loading players to each other. You can be, you know, how, how on earth do I do this? How, you know, I have to benchmark so many more things now to get a fair market value than I ever assumed. I'm saying I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm mm. sort of personalizing these organizations. And, and, and I think it is posing issues it's, that no one predicted. It's also posing issues because they're being, some, of these, some of these people are being pretty clever, right? Is Newcastle a multi-club model or not? Like, okay, the owners of Newcastle have invested in these four teams in Saudi. Do they consider themselves a multi-club model in the same way as a... A seven-seven group, or a Red Bull, or mm -hmm. a Eagle? Not really. Even you know who's top of the Spanish league at the moment? Girona. Girona. Right? Girona. Yeah. I think that's a forty-four yeah, percent stake is. that that Man City, that, uh, CFG have. That isn't, I suppose, the majority control, right? No. But so, it, but it would be more. Um, they're sort of, again, we're kind of learning by precedent. So mm. we had a, we had a whole space of this in the summer where. Aston Villa and uh, I can't remember the name of their club. Which one have they got a, a connection with in Portugal? Uh, it'll come back to me later. Uh, but Union Saint Gilwa and Brighton, and there was another link. There were three linked clubs that were going into UEFA competition, and they all had to either dilute their shareholding. So Villa diluted the Villa's owners diluted down in the Portuguese clubs to about thirty yeah. percent. That appears to be sort of the level where UEFA are comfortable. But also get into an agreement, a kind of a, almost a promise that we won't mm. trade players yeah. for a year or two. Yeah. Which is going to be, you know, if you look at Manchester United, who are about to do this deal with Jim Ratcliffe, who clearly has Ineos have majority control of Nice, you're gonna have a very odd situation where you have a, a minority stake but sporting control and it's going to be fascinating to see how that is worded in the official because all we're going off at the moment are briefings and reports and speculation how that is worded in the uh, agreement that will be announced at some point um, over the next few years um, slash decades um, is going to be fascinating because it you know there's how many times have you read over the last six months Man United want to sign the Nice defender uh, Todibo right how does that work? United didn't um, try and block um, the, uh, the those those kind of loans in that Premier League meeting this week. So I don't know if that's an indication, or they may just not have thought about it that much yet. I'm sure they. I'm sure there would have been a conversation somewhere. Um, so so even if you don't have control, or even if you don't have thirty percent, some of this can start to become really interesting. I think PSG and Braga are. That's it. That's similar yeah. kind of state right. now, right? But they've been in, in European competition. So th this is kind of on everyone's doorstep. And even those clubs that that aren't currently, I suppose, embroiled in it, they'll have an eye on their potential exit strategies, right? And not closing down potential new owners down the line who may be really keen on multi-club models. And therefore, you don't want to bring stuff in that deters people from investing. A bit like you'll never get a rule that bl that blocks state-linked funds, right, from being involved in Premier League clubs, being voted in by Premier League owners, because that might be their way out for a, a West Ham or a Spurs or whatever in a few years. Who knows? So those are the things, those are some of the complications and challenging things that we always, I think, media and football fans think, just deal with it. And actually, when you get into it, there's just another issue that emerges every time you unpick it. But then, uh, you know, where does that put a body like UEFA? Is is this an aging well, okay, it, organization it, it, whereby, you know, it, the, the game is moving at such a rapid rate? But, but, People are but, sussing out how to, you know, get over the line, as yeah. to say. It's like whack um, you know, but constantly sort of... Can you say the regulations are there in place already? No, but you're talking about UEFA. I mean, if we're going, mm. if you're, if people are then worried about Newcastle and Saudi, that's a FIFA issue, mm. right? Mm. And you've got mm. Mm. the CFG have clubs all over the world, yeah, yeah. right? Mm. So at some FIFA at the moment seem to be not really involved in this conversation, as far as I can tell. If, if there's going to be rules on this, it kind of has to come from them at some point. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, certainly some leadership, I think. Mm. You know, particularly as we're moving towards a Club World Cup where FIFA do want yeah. to have more of a role in the club game. Um, so look, this is a huge challenge for the industry. Um, but just sort of bringing it back to, to Lyon and, and, and France, you're absolutely right. Pretty much every single club, I'd argue, apart from PSG, is sort of for sale. And it's kind of for sale. They will be for sale because they're very much the fifth of the five big leagues. Um, if they're not careful, they're going to get replaced by someone like Portugal or maybe a merged Belgian-Dutch league. So they're there, and their TV rights um, aren't that popular. They don't, there's just not much interest in them abroad. It's a shame because, actually, if you watch the products, it's pretty good. It's certainly it's got this kind of reputation for being a very young league, uh, playing nice attacking football. But for whatever reason, it has struggled to get people outside of France, and I would dare, dare I'd say enough people in France, to really care enough to pay for it in the same way that Brits pay, English people pay to watch the Premier League and also, you know, Singaporeans and Indonesians and Americans pay to watch the Premier League. So there is a sort of existential issue there for France and therefore Lyon because Lyon aren't PSG and, you know, they, they need the French League to do well, to have any kind of chance of, you know, getting back to where they were when they were winning French titles. That they also, I think, at the moment, you have both the domestic and international rights are up for tender, and they are struggling. Yep. They are really struggling. I think there was some vague hope that you'd get someone like Apple come along and take all the rights, a bit like they have with MLS globally. I don't think that's going to happen. They've kind of been bailed out by being for quite for quite a long time, and they may do it again in the end. Who knows, right? But I think the priority, you know. In the lead up maybe to 22, that was all maybe a bit more of a priority to make sure we're looking after this league and still protecting it. I think now they're probably getting to the point where they get a load of grief quite a lot of the time. And I'm not sure they're as mad on it. And if they are as ma- if they are going to do it, I think they won't probably pay quite what quite what clubs want them to. Um, so it does. Li- and, then, and then you're going back to like begging Canal Plus. Right mm, to come back exactly. to the table, these yeah. guys that that Who you that, upset that you've upset, I'm told to leave. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let's bring this back full circle. Then um, I, I'm just trying to figure out or get a sense of what we've really learned um, from these conversations about our crisis clubs, um, Matt. Especially with COVID, and I keep coming back to it. I guess I think one of you alluded to it earlier. It, a lot of clubs struggled with COVID, but actually, clubs that weren't run well, yeah struggled more and it was glaringly obvious when someone like covid hit that there are a lot of clubs out there that really need to get their books in order i think that's it so you know it it's that black swan moment and are you ready um Mm. you know we're having an inquiry about it in this country aren't we how ready were we um and the countries that sort of got through it better were the ones that had a plan you know this is it's exactly the same with the football industry and what can what connects all of the clubs is that they were either running too hot, too close to the wind, whatever you know metaphor you want to use. They were, they were, they entered the crisis in bad shape. Mm. They were stretched. I'd argue there was a bit of bad luck for some of them. Never underestimate the impact of luck in life, but certainly in business and sport. So I think that it's that. It's this. This crisis came along, hurt all of them in different ways for different reasons. Be it you know they had a you know an amazing museum, or they were trying to build a stadium, or you know they relied on Chinese money, or whatever it is. But they were they were not in great shape when this crisis happened. Simple as that. Mm. Then it brings me the question, and we were th- th- thinking about this earlier. Is that I mean I, I felt. A lot of clubs are just running really close <laughs> to the edge, whichever way you look at it. Which clubs, or the bigger clubs in Europe, I should say, would you think are the best run clubs in Europe, most sustainably run clubs in Europe? It just depends how you how you define, define run. well run, mm-hmm. right? Like, are Man City going to go out of business? Well, not as long as the current ownership's in place, right? Like, and you know, But at the same time, they're facing 115 charges, mm. right? Is that mm. a well-run club? Mm. Mm. Arguably. They're very well-run now. Right. 
And, <laughs> well, well, you know, and, and how important is success on the field? Yeah. Because this is sport, right? You know, we're not talking about supermarkets, or you know, we are talking about sport. So, so winning presumably is part of part of your, you know, how you how you assess this. So, and even if you talk about, you know, we all talk about Brighton, right? Brilliantly run club. They've relied on a huge amount of owner investment, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. They, they may mm. get, to, you know, they'll get to a stage where they're sustainable as a club in the Premier League. Is that a well-run business? You'd say, yeah, really, but also hugely reliant on external factors to make yeah. sure it can happen. Um, I don't think there is, you know, if if we were asked to sit down as a, you know, one of the big four consultants tomorrow to say, this is how you run a football club and this is the perfect model. But there's never one way. It doesn't way. exist. There's never right? one way. Look, I, if I was just sort of, whilst Adam was talking there, I mean, I would probably throw maybe Real Madrid into the mix, mm. again, because of that whole conversation we had around Barcelona. So many of the things that Barcelona got wrong, Real Madrid have got, if not right, they've got it considerably less wrong than Barca. Mm. And I, I think, you know, this is hard. I'm not, no one's ever suggesting this is easy. So I would possibly suggest Real would be a, an example of a well-run club. Liverpool? You know, they, they get plenty wrong. And Liverpool would be another one. You know, on-field success... Um, a sustainable business. Um, the fabric of that club is clearly improved under that ownership. Their sort of status in the global game has clearly improved under that ownership. So I, would, I think you know Liverpool would have to be in the mix. I think Man City definitely a debate to be had because you cannot dispute the way that that club is run right now in terms of on-field success, in terms of what they do commercially, in terms of recruitment, mm -hmm. youth development. Bayern Munich. Mm. Serial yeah. winners. Yeah. Serial winners, but you could say kind of the model of German football helps them. It does. Substantially. Does it that does. make it doesn't mean that they're doing things wrong though? You no. know, and this is what I mean. It's so you can pick one and you can find a fault. But in terms of who's doing more right than wrong, both on the pitch and off the pitch, then yeah, you know. Equally I'd say mm -hmm. if Man United had been in Bayern Munich's position for the last fifteen years. You know, there's been years where Bayern Munich have, have made quite a few mistakes, but they still win the league. Yeah. Right. Last season they were pretty poor. By their, yeah, they tried not to win last they, year. Right. They did their best. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and you know they sat the chairman, didn't they? Basically yeah, the yeah. day, the day they won the league, and, um, but but because of the way German football is with the disparities, kind of means they can get away with it to a, to a broader extent. Um, sorry to Bayern Munich fans who I know. Loyal listeners. Mm. I still think they're a pretty well-run club. I agree. All right. Let's end on this one, right? Okay, so we've had our five crisis clubs, Everton, Barcelona, Inter Milan, Hertha Berlin, and of course, we were talking about Leon. Right. Mythical question. Hypothetical question, I should say. Um, the Athletic <laughs> have given you a billion dollars to invest in one of our crisis clubs. Which one are you taking, Adam? I don't know if a billion's enough for Barcelona to deal with all the <laughs> with all it's, the problems. Well, it's, it's not. It's not, is it? But um, it would it would certainly be a start. It would, it would have an impact. Yeah, yeah. I think you take Barcelona, don't you? Imagine running Barcelona, but you can't because the bloody fans. <laughs> you could be president. <laughs> you, could be run, you could be. You could run a nice campaign. Yeah, you could yeah. run a campaign. Yeah. Um, Some personal guarantees. I think Everton for a billion. If you've got a billion in your pocket, it'd be pretty good stuff. Yeah, if, if it's to buy total control of yeah. one. Yeah. I was just wondering because we we haven't really talked that much about Hertha, but you know, mm. but you could do you know, Hertha of the five, right? They're they're the sort of slightly unusual one in that they don't really belong here in many ways in terms of like their track record. I was just looking at it. You know, they were a great club in the twenties and thirties, but the rest of their story is you know just being sort of a bit of a calamity and being a bit of oh, you know at times a bit of a laughing stock, and yet they are the biggest club in a major European city, a cool European city, in uh, the capital of Europe's largest economy. So, I don't know. Do, you know who, do, I, mean, do, I, do I throw a billion at Hertha and try and turn, try and, you know, turn Hertha into one of Europe's giants? Maybe. I don't bring know. the hipster back to Hertha I, Berlin, I, I, is that what you're I saying? Was, I was talking to a, a chief exec of a European club, actually, about this series a couple of weeks ago. And they were trying to guess which clubs would be on the list. And I think they basically got three of them pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, I think Everton, Barcelona, uh, Inter. Inter. Yeah. Inter. Yeah. The other one they mentioned was Schalke. 
um, yes. which is an amazing ah, story. They, yes. they are, I was just looking at the table, 16th in the second division yep. of an 18-team league in in Germany. I mean, that's a club that was in the Champions and League. And they have been good more recently. Yeah. You know, um, you know, Hertha have only had one season in, in the Champions League. So, you know, I don't think they are... Still, you should read Raf's piece. You definitely but. read. <laughs> yeah, he absolutely explains. You know how there's the, the, you know, Berlin's biggest biggest team are a shambles, and it's you know a long running shambles, and also really neatly ties in to so many of the other things we're talking about. You know, they're owned by Triple Seven, mm-hmm. so therefore they're part of a multi club group. Um, there's governance issues. There's overspending. They've got this big old stadium that badly needs, you know, arguably knocking down, but certainly you know revitalizing so so many of the other the other points that we touched upon uh, are in the in the Herter story but um but let's do this again you know mm. we've we've you know, there's yeah, definitely honestly. definitely other clubs we've left on the table also also for for for, for any clubs who are offended by their description <laughs> as a crisis club because i'm sure they'll love that um they're welcome a to come on this podcast yes. and talk about it explain uh, why they're not and yeah. explain why they're not and if in 2 years time they turn out to be very, very clever. We mm. will also write about that. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Also, Adam, I really appreciate your time as well, contributing to the podcast this week. The entire Clubs in Crisis series is available to read in form only on The Athletic. You can, of course, catch up with all of this week's episodes wherever you get your podcast from. If you like this video, click subscribe for more content like this. We'll be joined by the likes of David Ornstein, Matt Slater, Adam Crafton, Carl Lanker, and plenty more through the season to bring you the inside track to the biggest stories in football. If you'd like to listen to the full episodes for free, search The Athletic Football Podcast wherever you get your podcast from. <laughs>